Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Best Ever You Show. Thank you so much for being with me uh, here today. And um, I've got the fabulous Liz Bruner. Who doesn't love Liz Bruner? Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me, Elizabeth. I know we've been trying to do this for a while, and I'm so glad we were finally able to connect today. Thank you. Uh, yeah, happy late summer. How's, how's your summer going? How are your goals going? I saw oh all these goals for Liz on Instagram that she had for herself. Well, you know, I was thinking about that this morning, actually, and I'm really proud of myself because I did not intentionally at the beginning of the summer say, okay, my goal one, goal two, goal three. Yeah. But as I was thinking about that this morning, I realized that I've accomplished some things that not that I didn't think I could do, but I have pushed myself out of my comfort zone. Number one, I wanted to get back to running. And while I'm very slow, I don't care. I'm doing consecutively more than four miles and it feels good most of the time. And I just I love being outside. I get to run along the Charles River in Boston. So it feels really, really good to me. Number two, something I did not intend to do when I started taking ballroom dance lessons a year ago was that I was going to enter a ballroom dance competition. And I did, and I had so much fun. I was so nervous. But I had a blast and I was really proud of myself because I did push myself out of my comfort zone. And I'm always telling my clients, hey, if you want to learn and grow, you've got to push yourself out of your comfort zone. So just accomplishing those two things this summer, I'm really proud of myself. Yeah, I I'm, really, myself. I'm really proud of you too. I saw, I saw you achieve those things and I was like, she said she was going to do it and she did it. Bravo. So time to set some new goals, right? Or keep going with... Exactly. <laughs> new goals. I got to set some new goals. <laughs> um, was now with the ballroom dancing, are you a former dancer? I know you're a former singer, but did, was dancing like, are you a former cheerleader anything around dancing or never? Not really. And it's funny because I am a classically trained singer and you would think that's where I want to go. But in my heart, somewhere along the way, I always wanted to be a dancer. Now, I did take hula lessons when I was growing up in Hawaii. <laughs> I don't know if that really counts. Uh, I did. Um, I was a cheerleader in college for one year. My voice teacher was furious that I was a cheerleader. <laughs> so I really didn't have any formal training. And it was because, well, Dancing with the Stars is my favorite show. Right. And I, I love watching not only the movement and the choreography, but the transformation that the contestants go through as a part of that journey. And that's one of the reasons why I've always loved it. And when I did a story, when I was working as a news anchor with Tony Dovalani, who was one of the professional pros on Dancing with the Stars, and I got to dance with him. We had an hour, we had more than an hour together, but we had one hour of our time together was him teaching me a 30 second tango. Oh my gosh, to dance with a champion like that is unbelievable. And I vowed then at some day I was going to take ballroom dance lessons. Now it took 15 years to get there, <laughs> but I finally did it last summer. And I'm so glad I did because it's just been a wonderful healing journey, a wonderful transformation journey of being able to connect what I feel on the inside with what's manifesting on the outside. I really love it. I'm having so much fun. Perfect. Yeah, I I've um I was a tap dancer forever and a gymnast. Yeah, I know that dancing thing, but the ballroom. I'm like, huh, maybe I should take a page out of your book and do some ballroom dancing. I'll have to. I bet you would be great at it, Elizabeth. I'm a great dancer, actually. It's like a <laughs> talent of his. And so I wonder. I will see that because um, you know maybe something there in the 24th and 25th year here will will add some things. So anyway, <laughs> out of your book. Let's talk about your book for a minute because oh, um, we aren't all marathons, dancing and news anchoring. We, you have a great book out there and I know who wrote the foreword. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Yeah. The book is entitled Dare to Own You, Taking Your Authenticity and Dreams into Your Next Chapter. And Jack Canfield did the foreword for my book. And I was so appreciative. I mean, talk about being scared to death to make a big ask. <laughs> he had been a podcast guest, as you have been. And I, I thought, okay, you know, his principle number 17 of his success principles is ask. So I thought, here we go. And so I did ask him. And he said, well, he said he would have to read it before he would do the forward because after all, it was his reputation on the line. And I'm like, of course, I want you to read it. So I was incredibly grateful that he did not only read it, but he did the forward. 
and I had some other wonderful endorsements. I still can't believe, Elizabeth, that I have a book out in the world. And it'll be, let's see, it came out in November of 2021. And I'm still, it still feels kind of surreal. I, you know, I, I pick it up and I, I have a copy it's here cool. and I'm like, okay, this, this is actually, it's like, it's here. <laughs> it exists. Yeah, I do that all the time. I, I think I, it was my so let's go back to you in, in kindergarten and preschool and stuff like that. And the reason why is because did you always dream of being a writer, being a news anchor? What like what? Who were you as a little kid? What did you dream of doing? I always thought I wanted to be an actress. And my uh, mother said I was Sarah Bernhardt. I was too dramatic. I don't know if I was or not. <laughs> but I had a lot of things that I thought I wanted to do. You know, I liked this and I liked that and I liked this and I liked that and I wanted to sing and I wanted to dance and. It, you know, I never thought I wanted to be a news anchor. There was a point in time when I thought I might be interested in television, but I didn't take that path. I actually went to Lawrence University's Conservatory of Music. I studied music. I was a high school music teacher. I sang semi-professionally, and that's what I did. Yeah. And I never really thought about something else until after I had been a teacher for a couple of years, and I just felt this feeling organically. There was something more I was supposed to do. I had absolutely no clue what it was. Yeah. But I felt that I needed to leave the teaching profession, teaching music, and figure it out. And I did. And long story short, I ended up in television and had a 28-year career. Yeah, which Crazy. Is yeah. And, and hold that book up again. Because it... I mean, oh, uh, shit. Yeah, I'd be yeah. happy to. <laughs> there we go. There's that book. Yeah, no, it's a great book. Dare to own you. What, like, when, when people see your book, what do you want them to know about your book? Like, what's in there? Mm -hmm. like, what are key, a couple of key things you want people to know? Why, why should we go out and rushed by your book. <laughs> well, the impetus for the book was a quote from my grandmother, which is no knowledge is ever wasted. And what that means to me is that no knowledge, no experience, no career chapter, nothing is ever wasted, good or bad experiences. It's all knowledge. It's all experiences. It's all information. And so I want people to, to know that you know more than you think you know. And you need to kind of just be willing to step back and put yourself in the witness position and say, okay, how can I connect all these dots of these experiences? Where might it lead me? Which is what led me to not only television, but to also having my own business now. The second thing is, so yes, I was a high school music teacher for a couple of years and sang semi-professionally. And I left not knowing what to do. I worked in retail to pay the bills. And then I had a 28 year television career. And then now I've been an entrepreneur, an executive coach, for almost nine years now, which I never ever wanted my own own my own business, but I was able to connect all those dots. And people say, "How did you go from being a music teacher to like being a news anchor?" Well, it's all storytelling. So that was one of the dots that I connected. And I always say the other thing I want people to take away from the book is, look, if I can do this, if I can make all these career chapters and changes, anybody can. Yeah. And I think the third thing, though, which is probably equally important, Elizabeth, is you have to give yourself permission. You have to give yourself permission to be your best authentic self, to think outside the box, to consider other things, other yeah. opportunities. And we don't often do that. So if we have a listener right there, because this is one of the biggest questions we get asked on the Best Ever You Network. So let's maybe both answer this if we can. We'll put our heads together and answer this. Okay. We get questions like, you know, I really want to do this, but I'm doing this and I have to do this right now because I've got, I make this much money. I've got this responsibility, this response, but boy, my heart is not here. It's here. Mm -hmm. I want to go from here to here. Yes. Believe me, I hear that all the time and I thought of it myself. It's like, okay, I've got all these responsibilities. I can't think about this. I've got family. I've got income coming in. And if I suddenly do a right turn, this isn't going to work. I can't do that. Yeah. But I think what you can do is you can begin incrementally to say, okay, what can I do? Can I do one thing every day towards maybe moving in that direction? You're not going to do a right turn all of a sudden, but can you incrementally take baby steps to achieving that goal? Perfect. Whether, you know, whether it's a new career path, whether it's taking care of yourself in terms of self-care and, and healing your own self, doing therapy, whatever it is, what can you do? What one thing can you do every day that's going to move you forward in the direction you'd like to go? 
What's yeah. your answer to that question? Pretty much the same. I, I would say the same thing. And and sometimes, really though, sometimes I do think it is a full on leap and lick the wounds <laughs> if you well, can. I mean, I've done that. With the band aid off, right? You just yeah, got to go for it. I'm just like, oh, I got to do this. I mean, I've moved, I've, I've been divorced. I've moved across the country. I mean, I've done various things in my life where like, oh, they they feel abrupt, maybe to other people, but for me, mm. I've been thinking about it for a it's while. It's been percolating, right? And, it's uh, been in yeah, there. It's, it's been it's been doing its thing but to, so i i would add to that and just say you know sometimes um the people the, the people are used to you being you so when you're trying to make a change or when you're trying to do this or that especially if it's super abrupt um people are going to be like whoa what's she doing what's he doing you know kind of thing and the people kind of have to catch up to you and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't and that's the thing and and they might feel like naysayers or not on, not on your team and whatever, and that's okay. Sometimes you need a new set of people around you to achieve what you're going to do. So, and that's uh, hard too because emotionally that means another transition, another transformation. And sometimes, you know, people have come into your life for a season and a reason, and sometimes they'll stick with you through all of those seasons, through all of those changes that you may need to go through. But it is hard. And if you find that that your circle is not supporting you, to your point, you may need to let go of them and allow others to come into your circle. And that's a really hard thing to do. Can be, yeah, very. very. Um, and what do you think about um, dreaming big? Mm. You, have <laughs> to dream. you have to dream big. You know, it's, it's funny because... I, I look at the business that I've created and I've built and from coming from a place of a never, ever wanting to own my own business. In fact, if you had said to me 10 years ago, Liz, you're going to have your own business. You're going to have a podcast that's heard around the world in 140 different countries. You're going to have an online platform, BrunerAcademy.com. And oh, by the way, you're going to have a best selling book. I would have said, what? I would said, there's no way that's all going to happen. But guess what? It did because I did choose to dream big. Now, did I know all of those pieces were going to fall into place 10 years ago? Absolutely not. Not even when I started my business did I think all of that was going to happen. Yeah. But it did. And, and I think it's so important to dream big. You may not know how you're going to get there. And sometimes you don't always need to know how. You just need to take baby steps towards that direction. Yeah. Okay, so I'm 52 and you're 26. We know oh, you're yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we got a few years on you, my dear. <laughs> about dreaming big at our ages. Right. Can we so, can we do anything? Is there like some magic? Uh, I remember when I turned 40, I was like, hmm, according to everybody, this is it. <laughs> Check, oh you know, kind God. of thing. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, so it feels like 50 is the new 30 or 40, you know, just, it feels differently. And what is that? Is there some social, social shift happening or why am I allowed to publish books now? In my you're really good at it, number one. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? It's, to me, it's like, wow, I'm doing some of the things I, I'm just getting, I'm rolling my sleeves up, just getting started. And I'm in my fifties. Right. right. Same with you, you know, there, and then 26. No, there's no age limit. You know, I think sometimes your 20s, you know, that's when you experiment, you try different things. You've got sons who are in their 20s and they're experimenting, they're trying different things, they're off to college, they're doing other things. Look, and then your 30s, you kind of maybe get established, but you know what? A lot of people are changing careers these days and I don't think that's a bad thing because I think it's that you're following your passion and your priorities, hopefully, and your purpose, even though you may not know what the heck that is. <laughs> and then your 40s are different, your 50s are different. I mean, I started my business in my 50s, I'm over 60 now and I'm like, okay, What's next, Liz? What's next? I mean, we're, we're hopefully healthier, living longer. We're taking better care of ourselves. And you know what? The word retirement is not in my, my brain. Now, will I continue to always be working as hard as I am right now? Probably not. And that's okay. I don't know what's going to be next. I mean, I have some ideas of what I want to be next. Yeah. But I don't think that there should be an age limit on anything. In fact, I talk about that in my book. What, who, who decides? Yeah. What age something, you know, oh, I'm done. I'm done learning. I'm done growing. I'm done reinventing, recreating myself. No. Yeah. Keep growing. Did you watch that document? This is off. The, did you watch that documentary with Shania Twain yet? And no, that, but I do want to see it. Is it good? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I, she's my she's one of my idols too. You're one of my oh. idols. She's one, she, she just has she had some things, ha- you know, along the way, and she's just keeps she keeps going and going, reinventing, you know, all these things, and she's um, she's just got some pipes on her. Yeah, but isn't that what life is about, Elizabeth? It is about recreating ourselves over and over again and being willing to learn and being willing to grow. Because if you stop learning and you stop growing, what what are you doing? What can I do? Yeah, Yeah, exactly. All right, let's talk about your podcast. So this podcast, this is, I just saw that Burberry, uh, um, something, blue. Blueberry. 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 Yeah. Purse. Here, I'm purse on the brain. Um, <laughs> oh, well, that's just me. Everybody knows that purses. All right. Live your, your, live your best life podcast. Yes. It is just amazing. It's, it's, oh. it's all around the world now. It's winning awards. I saw you with all these trophies and everything you won for it. Okay. T- tell us about your podcast. Well, the podcast is called Live Your Best Life with Liz Bruner, and it really is about transformational journeys and creating next chapters, rising above challenges in life and and learning and growing from them and being able to share those stories. My personal belief is that when other people hear the, the guests that I have on my show, who've all been phenomenal, including you, about how we've moved through life and, and the lessons we've learned along the way, the obstacles we've overcome, the challenges we've risen above, how we've recreated ourselves, to me, that gives hopefully inspiration and motivation to somebody to say, you know what, if, if that person did it, maybe I can too. And I mean, I've just interviewed some amazing people I, um, last week. It's a podcast that's going to be coming up in September uh, with a man by the name of Chris Waddell. He's a paraplegic and he became a paraplegic from a skiing accident at the age of 20. And his story is phenomenal. He went on to be a monoskier who's the fastest, was the fastest monoskier in the world. He was in the Paralympic Games and won numerous medals. He's in the Hall of Fame. And oh, by the way, he climbed up Mount Kilimanjaro in in a hand wheelchair, wow. literally moving inch by inch by inch by inch. And his story's chronicled in a documentary. I mean, it's people like that that make you go, you know, I'm not having a bad day. <laughs> like, you know, I think I just need to remind myself of some of the people who are extraordinary. That's some of the best advice actually ever. When you're having a bad day, remove yourself from your, remove yourself. Don't listen to my podcast. <laughs> yeah, listen to our podcast, do something. But when you're having a bad day, remove yourself from yourself. Go volunteer, go do some, change the perspective of your bad day because somebody, your bad day is somebody's dream, I swear. It is true. It's true. And you know what? Look, we all fall into a funk from time to time, myself included. It's life, it's human, it's being a human being. And, you know, sometimes I'll feel sorry for myself and go, okay, Liz, you, you're allowed to pout for a little bit here. <laughs> and then, okay, pick myself up. It's time to keep moving and time to time to turn it around. And what can I be grateful for? What do I have in my life? You know, I, I'll, I'll share one funny story. I, I had been working on a script for something and I could not for the life of me find it in my Google Drive, in my, I could not find it anywhere. And I thought, did I did I really put it in the trash accidentally? I looked in the trash, could not find it. And I just kept saying, angels, please help me find this. Well, guess what? I found it yesterday. Oh, I, had written, I had written it in the Pages app as opposed to my Google <laughs> Drive. I have no idea why, but I was like, thank you. I found it and it just raised. I was so excited that I found it. <laughs> Super funny. <laughs> Yeah. And what do you do with it? What what is this document we speak of? <laughs> Are we allowed to know? Um, it's it's a script for some little Instagram reels that I want to begin doing. So that's all I'll say about it. Little yeah. little nuggets, I hope of 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 wisdom and inspiration and motivation. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, let's talk about inspiration, wisdom, motivation, and all those things because I just had the put. You're you have been a life coach forever, but I had the privilege of having you in my class and and adding a designation to your many. Um, so it's comma CPC, which is certified professional coach, which yeah. you were already and everything, but, but it was so much fun to just have you in class and kind of have you monitor my class. Have you, you know, give feedback on what worked, what doesn't work, you know, those kinds of things. It was, it was so nice having you there. Um, talk about being a coach. So, mm-hmm. you know, cause we went from, you know, singer to news anchor to, you know, you're, you're a life coach and, you have wisdom to share. 
And how's, how's that, how's that working out? What do you, do you love it? Are you having fun with that? Is it? Well, I'm still doing it for almost nine years, which is a good thing, (laughs) but I truly enjoyed being in your class with you. And, you know, it is true that I feel like I've been a coach and, and, you know, yes, it's nice to have that stamp, if you will, the certification process, but I feel like my whole vision for my life, Elizabeth, whether it's personal or professional, whether it's coaching, whether it's my podcast, whatever it is, it's really about how can I teach How can I motivate? How can I inspire people to live their best life? Whatever that means for them, because everybody has a different definition. And so whether somebody comes to me because they want to get better at public speaking, great. I can help them with that. I've got the tools. I've got the, I've got the toolbox for that as well. If somebody comes to me and says, I don't know how to, to figure out what my next chapter is going to be. I feel stuck. I feel lost. I'm able to help them with that as well, at least give them ideas to help them think outside the box, which is often what needs to happen, and come at it from a different lens. Because sometimes we get so mired in our own way of thinking that we we can only see down one lane. And I love being able to say, okay, wait a minute, let's let's stretch this out to a four lane highway. (laughs) Maybe let's really think outside the box. Have you considered this? Have you considered that? And, and to be able to put a different lens on things for people sometimes. And I also hope and pray that, you know, some of my experiences, obstacles, good, bad, all of the above, can shed light on helping people understand that, you know what, we're all going to go through challenges. Life is going to throw us curveballs, but we can rise above it. We can have resilience and we can move forward. Mm. T- let's talk about your mom. Because that when you're talking, I'm thinking, mom, 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 <laughs> and, you're, and how special your mom is to you. Yes. Well, she is 87 years old, and she truly is the wisest person I know, and, and I did dedicate my book to her. And, you know, it's interesting because she's going through some health challenges right now, and I'm suddenly realizing, whoa, whoa. Yeah. You know, she's 87, and... God willing, I'll have her for many more years. But now the questions in my mind are creeping in of how much longer will I have her? I mean, she's nothing imminent, but it, it, it puts a different lens, a different light, if you will, on our, our limited time together. Cause she's in California and I'm in Boston. So, you know, I check in with her almost daily and just see how she's doing and things like that. But yeah, I've been pretty blessed to have an amazing mom. Yeah. Do you um, do you ever think about, oh, I should move near her, like move to California or her have her move near you or anything like well, that? Well, I, I love California, but <laughs> let's call it the tax state. Massachusetts is pretty <laughs> high. But you yeah. know what? Where, where she's living right now. So my father was a minister and she lives in a community of retired ministers, ministers, wives, spouses, husbands. Uh, missionaries, things like that. So she's in a really good place and she hates winter. So moving her to Boston or anywhere on the East Coast would not be a good plan. <laughs> but uh, no, she's in a good spot and yeah. she knows it. She we're knows. In, we're in Cal- I'm, we moved here from California. Oh, she's in Claremont. She's at a place called Pilgrim Place in Claremont. Nice. Yeah. We're from the um, Tahoe. Ah, okay. Well, my, two of my kids were born in Walnut Creek and then we moved oh. Look, I love California, especially yeah. Southern California, San Diego, that whole area. I love oh. it. <laughs> so pretty. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, I love San Diego. But let's talk about, uh, because we're crunching time here a little bit, I don't want to keep you for too much longer. Um, Bruner Academy, um, your website, and then the top three things you need to know to be a like better speaker. I said kick ass before we went on the air. <laughs> I like kick ass. Come on. <laughs> Because right, I'll, I'll start with that. I'll start with that. So, <laughs> yeah. So you you said you wanted three things, but I'm actually going to give you four, and I call them Liz's four C's. Number one is confidence. Yep. Number two is knowing your content. Mm. Number three is having clarity of your content, which means you have to know how to put a really good story together. And most people do not know how to do that. They're very old school in terms of, I'm going to tell you this today. And then they tell you, and then they retell you what they told you. That doesn't work today. That does not work today. And I have a whole format of how you can put your story together. That's really going to communicate, connect and engage with the audience. But number one is confidence. Number two is that content, putting it together well, clarity of that content. Can everyone understand what you're saying? 
And number four is being conversational. So many people, when they get up to speak publicly, they suddenly think that they need to be very formal and they can't allow their authenticity and their personality to come through. Forget all of that. That's not what's going to make you connect with your audience. It's not what's going to resonate with your audience. So confidence, content, clarity of your content, and being conversational. Those are four. I know you asked for three, but we got no, to go. No, no, no. <laughs> and then BrunnerAcademy.com, which is my online learning platform. Thank you for asking about that. I have a number of um, public speaking courses, but I also have my flagship public speaking course, which is how to be a rock star public speaker. And I take you through everything you need to know and you, it's self-paced, you can do it online. There's also the VIP version where you actually get coaching once you're done. You have some chances to do some virtual coaching sessions with either me or one of my colleagues. So it's a really great opportunity to learn and grow everything from making a pitch, making a presentation. Maybe you have to do a wedding toast. It's all included <laughs> in my course. So I invite people to check it out. Yeah. And also we have four courses that align with my book and they're called Dare to Go for Your Goals, Dare to Rise Above Tough Times, which is about resilience, Dare to Shift from Procrastination to Motivation, and then <laughs> Dare to Find Peace of Mind, which is really a very simple meditation mindfulness course. And a lot of people say, oh, I've tried to meditate. I can't do it. Well, this might help you. So they're very easy, simple courses, and I encourage people to take advantage of them. Perfect. Okay. And then what can I find on lizbruner.com? Well, that's my website. And if you go to my website, you can learn all about me <laughs> and what I'm doing in my team. But it also, it has links to my book. It has links to my podcast. It has links to BrunerAcademy.com and all the services and, and also the wonderful testimonials we've had from clients we've been working with all across the country and around the world, in fact. So I invite people to check it out. Take a look. And I'm going to take one question from our audience. Oh, wonderful. Several questions get emailed in because people knew you were coming on um, in our in our inner circle. People knew. But we have one question I'm going to ask you. And somebody wants to know, who is the, mo the most exciting or most influential person to you, maybe not the world, that you've ever interviewed? Like who inspired <laughs> you and you can only pick one? Oh, you know what? People right. often ask me, you know, what was your favorite story? What was your favorite interview? And it's nearly impossible to answer after 28 years on television. Sorry, I'm doing it. Okay, so <laughs> I, I will preface that by saying that. I'll preface my answer by saying that. I had the opportunity to do many exclusive interviews. President Barack Obama, I interviewed Oprah, I've interviewed Barbara Walters. I had the opportunity to do medical exclusives like a face transplant and double hand transplant. Wow. So those kinds of stories were unbelievable. But if I were to say which one I had perhaps the most fun with, <laughs> It would be with Tony Dovolani from Dancing with the Stars. And people laugh when I tell them that. They're like, of all the 28 years, that's the story you pick? And I think because it speaks to something very organic within my soul, and I probably need to do more um, processing to figure all that out. But it truly, I mean, that was just an amazing experience. And he's an amazing teacher. He's an amazing human being. And it was probably one of the most fun Maybe you have a goal to be on Dancing with the Stars. Well, I, I did do, you know, but, but the, the fact of the matter is I have to be much more famous to be on the show. <laughs> I'm not quite there. Maybe you can help me get there. <laughs> well, we said it out loud, universe. So let's That's right. I want to be on the show. But, you know, I'd probably be like the oldest competitor on the show by the time I get there. <laughs> 26 years old. You got plenty of time. Okay, good. <laughs> anyway. All right. It's, and then finally, really, truly, is, um, is there any... Anybody, I, anything I haven't asked you, and and my question to you is, you know, of who who seems the most interesting to other people that you've interviewed? You know, like who does everybody always ask about? Like, what are they really like, or whatever? Who 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 do people go crying for? And don't give us any secrets. We're we're not that kind of a show, but. <laughs> Well, a lot of people always want to know, what was it like to interview the president? Yeah. You yeah. Know? And look, I mean, I was honored to interview President Barack Obama. It took me four years to get that interview, mind you. And I kept writing to the White House and people made fun of me in the newsroom. Like, oh, there goes Liz again, writing to the White House. Because, you know, I was sending a generic email to the blind, you know, communications office. But finally, one day... I got an email reply and it had a name. Oh boy, did I latch onto that very quickly. And so for me, you look, it doesn't matter what your politics are, to have the privilege and the honor of interviewing a world leader, a sitting president, 
is indeed an honor. And I had that opportunity and I was the only one in Boston that did. So I was very grateful for that. And, and what I loved about that interview also was I thought, how can I connect with this person who's a world leader? How can I connect with him on a human level? So I, he was born in Hawaii and I grew up in the islands. I wasn't born there. I was born in Connecticut. And then we moved to Hawaii when I was less than a year old and we were there till I was 10. So we had that in common, the Hawaiian islands. So when he walked into the room and I was already set up and waiting, he walked in and he said, hello, Liz. And I said, hello, Mr. President. It's nice to meet you. Or should I say aloha? And so we had this wonderful little moment of kind of a connection. And then I saved one question for the very end of my interview with him because I thought, oh, good Lord, if his PR people kick me out of the room, I'm, I'm going to be screwed. I'm not going to have all my other questions. And so I asked him, I said, you're the president of the United States. You're also a father of two teenage daughters. Which is harder? Oh, yeah. And he said, well, he was very lucky. He had two really great daughters. And do you know, Elizabeth, of the people who saw all four stories that I managed to create out of the interview that I did with him, that's what people remember. They remember the Hawaii piece and they remember the father piece. Yeah. 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 And when you interview yeah. someone like that, do you have yeah. to be perfect? perfect? <laughs> I wish. I'm never perfect. Good Lord. Look, you know, I did my best, obviously. Like, are they cool with you doing your best or are they expect you to be perfect? Well, look, I mean, did I feel the pressure? Absolutely. You know, and once it was a go, I mean, there were all kinds of meetings of what we were going to ask him, what I was going to ask him. And, you know, I had to create four different shows out of the interview that I did with him, four different stories for the 5, 536 and the 11 p.m. newscast that night. So I had to really, you know, fine tune everything. And so I tried very hard to have a coherent conversation with him, but I also knew that I wasn't going to be able to do as many follow-up questions as I normally would because I had so much content and so many topics that I had to cover that, you know, my news directors expected, that the White House expected, that I expected. So we managed to cram it all into a very few short minutes. Yeah. So yeah, the pressure's on. But you know what I also told myself that day, Elizabeth? You're here at the White House. You're interviewing the president. Try to be as present in the moment as you possibly can be and just enjoy. Trust yourself. You can do this. And that was the mentality that I took that day. And I had fun. How do you, so how do you interview somebody like that and not want to be their friend after? You know what I mean? How do you, how do you disconnect from just being like wanting to be loyal, be their friend and know them and so forth? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, like when I, I remember when I first got to meet you, I'm like, you know, that's somebody I just want to absolutely be friends with. Is that hard to go from some, interviewing somebody you really love and admire to just being like, okay, I got to go back to work now or whatever. No, you, you, you have to be able, you know, as, as a journalist, when you're the reporter and you're the interviewer, you're wearing many hats in that moment. Because you are, you are asking the right. questions, you're right. listening at the same time, you're producing in your head, have I asked, do I need to follow up? It's like there are all these layers that are going on. And in some cases, you might have to let go of that personal I because it's always then about them. It's never about you. It's always about them. Yeah, that's a really it's good point. always about them. Yeah, good point. And, and do you ha when you're in a situation like that too, do you have to talk? When you talk, when somebody's in politics, can you get through a whole interview without mentioning politics or is there always politics involved? I think there was, well, I think there was a little bit of politics. I don't know if questions, right? I have like 10 questions, none of them about politics. Yeah, well, one of them was, I think it was about the infrastructure and bridges and something or other. I don't know what it was at the time. It's been, it seems like ages ago now, but. You know, I got my questions in that I wanted to ask. No, so. yeah, I, I love hearing that. You know, Aloha and the kids. It's beautiful. All right. Well, you are beautiful. Um, I absolutely love every moment I get to spend in your company. It's it's always learning. It's always growing. It's always smiles and positive energy. And um, I just I hope everybody has thoroughly enjoyed uh, this interview. And uh, we're so grateful for you. Well. I'm always, always grateful to spend time with you as well, Elizabeth. I don't know if people know, we first connected on LinkedIn. That's how we got to know each other. And we've been fast friends ever since. And I so appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, to share whatever I can with your audience. 
and I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate you. One more time. We're closing on the book. Oh, yes, we are. Dare to own you, taking your authenticity and dreams into your next chapter. Please get it, review it, write a review, tell your friends about it. And I hope, let me know how you feel about it. Let me hear from you. I'd love that. Thank you. All right, everybody, we're signing off. Thank you so much for listening to the Best Ever You Show, watching actually the Best Ever You Show. Um, If you're listening to this also, we do put this um, in uh, audio format in our podcast feed as well. So, all right, take care. Thanks, Liz, so much. Everybody go to LizBruner.com. Take care. Bye. Bye.